Okay? Thank you. Uh, you have to be, ooh, still there. You have to be older than me or at least as old as me to know what this reference is. Peter Sellers movie, 1960-ish. Anybody, know, anybody, anybody ever heard of the movie How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb? See? Got to be really old. One or two. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate that. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's solidarity, I'm sure. I'm sure. But I appreciate it. Um... This was, this was a movie from when we were in the middle of nuclear, like, it could happen to you kind of thing, right? Learning to hide under desks in school because any minute now. Um, so that, that, that's where that movie's from. And I, I, that's the only connection to the movie. It's just, I thought about it while I was thinking about this title. And I was thinking about as we start the Vacation Bible School week, um, this church, this community has been known for many years as a community that says, we've got the skills, we've got the talents, God has blessed us with something special that we can use to minister to kids. It's always been that church. Not to say that other churches aren't. It's just this one, this one has always been. And so every year when we come to this time, you know, there's, there's this, all oh, right, are we still that church? You know, are we still this church that has it in us, you know? And, and should we be? Is Vacation Bible School important? Are children's Sabbath schools important? What, are youth activities important? Why does this stuff matter? And I was thinking about this. I've been thinking about this for weeks. Um, and I want to start by talking about culture. So I live in a world where culture is crucial. About every three or four or five years, I go work at a different company. And I'm the stranger. I'm the new guy. And all power is given into my hands, so to speak. And it's very, it would be very easy for me to say, hey, from now forward, this is the way we're going to operate. But I also have learned over the years that culture is far stronger than mission statements, strategies, anything else. Culture trumps everything. And I wanna, I wanna talk to you for a minute, I wanna give you a couple quotes. Um, a lot of you won't know this either. See, I'm giving you American cultural history here. There, was, there were two guys, there were probably more, back in, I don't know, Mr. Ken might know, but they invented the internet browser, the very first internet browser. You guys use Firefox today, you use Google Chrome, you use Safari, you use Edge if you're unlucky. Um, but you use something to live out on the internet. Well, the first one was invented at the University of Illinois by two students. One was named Mark Andreessen, one was named Ben Horowitz, and they invented the Mosaic browser. And it was the first one, and they made a lot of money. And Mark became famous for being a technologist, and Ben became famous for being a culturist. And Ben, uh, he, he, if you ever want to read a great, great books on the life of organizations, read stuff Ben's written. But I want to, I want to tell you, here's a couple of things that I wanted to pull, uh, that I pulled from his most recent book, which is still probably 10 years old. There's a saying in the military that if you see something below standard and you do nothing, then you've set a new standard. This is also true of culture. If you see something off culture and you ignore it, you have created new culture. That is the power of culture. You don't even realize you're doing it and you're creating culture. Right now, we're all creating culture, right this minute. Even more, more poignantly, Ben, in one of his books, said, culture is complex. Culture is, and this is the important thing, how people behave when you're not looking. What do they do when they're left to their own devices? This is the biggest challenge in organizational life, right? I would like this organization to do this, and you state it from the very top. 
I want this organization to be customer service oriented. You know, I want, I want our customers to feel approved. But you, you lay out this whole manifesto about corporate culture around customers, and then your guys in the field go and they treat your customers horribly because you're not looking, you didn't, you didn't really create culture, you just said something. Okay? So the question I have is, how do you create a culture in an organization that's a community, a church, a volunteer association of people? How do you create a culture that disciples kids? How do you do that? And I want to start off, oh, Patrick, is Patrick here? Patrick's not here. Patrick, it, you. If I get to the, eight, to the let's pray and I haven't told you the Dewey story, remind me to tell you the Dewey story, okay? Something Judy said to me in the car the other day reminded me this is a good story and I, I didn't have time to include it, so I just got to remember to include it. Patrick, remind me. All right, here we go. I want to talk to you about the Shema. This is, this is how I learned to love Deuteronomy. To me, it's one of the best passages in the whole Bible. And it is, and, and it's why I love the book of Deuteronomy. This is Moses talking to the children of Israel. And you know this, this is in, uh, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And you've heard this before. Because he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Where, do you, where did you think that came from? You know that passage. Where do you think that came from? Jesus said it, right? To the rich, to the rich young man who came to him and said, what must I do to be saved? You know, and, and Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. And he said, which ones? Or, you know, right, and... And, and Jesus says this, right? Or actually, I think the rich young man says it, and Jesus said, you have said correctly, right? Jesus uses this exact thing. He tacks one on, and he says, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? But, but this is the core, the, the, the thread that links Judaism to Christianity. It is the current that goes from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and you can just see, I always picture Moses, 120 years old, 120 years old. And he's addressing the people of Israel and he's telling them this. Now there's a million children of Israel. Ten giant football stadiums full of people. And Moses is addressing the people at 120 20 years old. I would imagine they were relaying this back through the crowd. Unless God gave Moses a voice. I don't know. Or a PA system, you know, one or the other. But I'm just envisioning this scene. And the way, the, way I, the way I relate to this is, this is the Shema. This is the words that I'm supposed to say. This is what I'm supposed to, if I am a follower of God, especially if I came from polytheistic Egypt and I you know, came out into the desert and I had a God who said, I, there's, no, there's no other gods now, it's just me, baby. This is, this, is, this is something, this is my mantra. And it's very famous. But the Shema goes on. It goes on after this, after the part we know really well, and it goes into a second very famous part. And to me, this is the actions that go with the words. Words, mission statement. Action, culture. And here are the actions. And these words which I command today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, it sounds like all the time. It sounds like all the time. This is my personal culture test. This is just me, right? Is something, if something is part of my culture, I don't just have it up here. It's something that I believe strongly enough to teach it 
all the time. All the time. When I wake up, when I walk, make dinner, go to work, whatever. I don't know what's on the next slide, so, oh yeah, so. <coughs> so to me, the Shema is the gospel, or it is the, it is the, you know, the core of who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act it out. And I want to tell you something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things today that are my perspective as a parent, and you can, you're going to be offended by them. So I'm telling you in advance. Barry said that I could speak here on August 5th again. He may retract that. <laughs> so one of the things I've discovered is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just make a statement. Kids remember what you do, not what you say. Okay? I get to listen to discussions a lot about kids talking about adults. And I almost never hear them say, can you believe what so-and-so said? Their words were blah, 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 blah. What I hear a lot is, do you remember that time when that adult did this thing for us? Craig, I didn't know you were going to be here today, so I, I had this illustration all about Craig. For the rest of their lives, there will be a group of kids in this church that will say, do you remember that time when Dr. Craig took us rock climbing? They will remember that forever. I don't know if Craig said 10 words other than, no, don't do that. They won't remember any of those words. They'll remember he took them. They'll remember he invested in them. Okay? I want to tell you some stories. My childhood. I want to tell you about John Slater, Mr. Slater. His son was in my grade. Mr. Slater was a salesperson for a ball bearing company. Can you imagine a more boring job? He sound, sells round things to people that need round things. Mr. Slater was my early teen Sabbath school teacher. He was the only early teen Sabbath school teacher we had. If Mr. Slater was on vacation, we didn't have early teen Sabbath school. All I remember is he was there every week. He probably wasn't. You know, um, I don't know if Ted knows Mr. Slater. Some people in this audience will know these people. Um, you know, if, if Roy was here, he'd know some of the people I'm going to talk about. Ted's from New Jersey. He would know. But that's what I remember about Mr. Slater. He was there. I remember something even more. He was also my Pathfinder unit counselor, you know, and so he was the adult that was responsible for all the kids and path, boys and pathfinders my age, and I remember that we would go on these campouts, and Mr. Slater was not vegetarian, and uh, each unit had to cook for itself, and they would give us, you know, okay, here's your food for today, and for breakfast, they'd give us these little cans of linkettes, saucets, linkettes, you know what they are, if you do? And we would go, Mr. Slater, how do we cook these? And he'd go, I do not know. Open the can and just pull them out and eat them as far as I know. Because he brought steak and eggs. So he got the frying pan first. I remember what Mr. Slater did. I remember Mr. Kober, my best friend's father, who uh, was very German, didn't speak English very well, and um, lived in Germany during the war. And um, I remember he taught us auto mechanics. But because he was German, he strongly believed that water-cooled engines were from the devil. And only air-cooled engines were worthwhile. So I will teach you auto mechanics, but it's going to be on my Volkswagen. You, you, that's the only car worth repairing. All the others are just junk. I remember, he was, a, he was a counselor too, I remember Danny Rowe, not related to me, there were lots of Rows. Danny Rowe, he was about five years older than me, and for a while he was also a, 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 a unit counselor and pathfinders for me, and I remember the, the first time I went on a pathfinder camp out, my dad gave me the choice between his old army sleeping bag and a slumber bag, you know, like the other you would use indoors in the summer. 
And I wanted the slumber bag because it was red, white, and blue. It was shiny. It was nice. The army bag was made out of wool. It was horribly scratchy. Did not want it. My dad didn't correct me. It was going to get, it got cold at night. I froze. And my teeth were chattering. And I remember Danny Rowe going, dude, come take my sleeping bag. And he let me have his sleeping bag, and he slept in my sleeping bag. And in the morning, I said, how come you weren't cold in my sleeping bag? And I was. He goes, oh, I froze. I froze. Next time, bring a real bag. Taught me how to camp. Remember Pastor Halleck? In New Jersey, we didn't play softball much. We played baseball. Pastor Halleck was five foot six. You couldn't strike him out in baseball. He always played baseball with us because he was too short. Um, and, so he, and he wasn't good at it. So he would just stand there with a bat on his shoulder. He either had to throw three strikes or he was going to walk. Showed up for every baseball game. Did it every time. I remember Pastor Toscano, the father of a couple of really good friends of mine. Pastor Toscano, I found out, my parents went to a gala ball uh, for the local Avenus Hospital. And my dad's there in his suit, tie. My mom's there in her full-length gown. There was a symphony. There was ballroom dancing. And all the Avenus were clustered up against that wall, except Pastor Toscano and Betty. Do you remember Pastor Toscano? They had left, I think. You remember them, Ted, a little bit? You know who they were. They danced so elegantly around that room. He was in a tux. Betty, I mean, they were just swirling, tripping the light fantastic. And I, and I turned to Mark, my friend, their son. I said, how did they learn to dance? And he said, they were Catholic. And, and I said, yeah, but they're Adventists now. And he's like, doesn't mean they forgot how to dance. And I realized that Pastor Toscano was always one of those people. Tim was one of the best men in our wedding. He was always one of those people, Pastor Toscano, who was always a moderating influence in my life. He would always whisper in my ear and say things like, it's okay to dance. It's okay to eat meat. It's okay. You're not gonna, you're, you're not, you know, the angels don't run away from you when, you when you take a bite. Mr. Ziesmer. Eighth grade teacher, principal of the school. At the time, I was five foot two. Maybe I tipped the scales at 102 pounds, but not much over 100. Mr. Ziesmer was my size, a little bit bigger, more blocky. Young enough that he could still run. And one day, he hit a ball, playing baseball, way over the outfielder's heads. And I was the pitcher, so he hit it off me. So I run to cover home plate, and the ball is coming in. I knew that it wasn't going to get there in time. He was going to have hit a home run. But I wasn't paying attention, and I was blocking the plate. He hit me so hard. So hard, I flew 10, 15 feet in the air. I, was, I couldn't breathe. I was lying on my back, couldn't breathe. And when I finally started to get my breath back, he walked over, reached down, offered his hand, and said, you were blocking the plate. Pulled me up and walked away. That night, he came to my house. He drove to my house, came to my house while we were having dinner, and he said, that's not what God wanted me to do. I'm sorry. And I remember thinking, wow, God has a high calling on people. If, if, if my principal, my eighth grade teacher is willing to apologize to a stupid kid. I just remember thinking, there's something there. Anyway, got lots of stories. My dad died two years ago. My dad was always just my dad. He was my Pathfinder leader. I remember that. But he was still, first and foremost, my dad. I was kind of almost embarrassed that my dad was the Pathfinder leader. Um, my dad didn't like to camp. Late at night, after everybody went to bed, after taps was played, we did play taps. Um, he would go get a hotel room in town. <laughs> Hated camping. Hated it. But I was the Pathfinder leader for 10 years until my sister w went out. I didn't think much of it. My dad, when he died, I got, I got all these communications. My dad was a math teacher in, in high school. I got all these people writing me letters going, your dad saved me. 
You know, it, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, that not Jesus kind of saves. Like, I, there's no way I was going to pass math. And your dad told me, if you stick with me, if you do the work, you will pass. I will make sure you pass. And I had all these people writing these notes to me and, you know, and, and uh, I had some guy who served with my dad in the Army. My dad's MOS was nuclear engineer in 1960. I have no idea what that meant. It doesn't sound good. But I get, all of a sudden, I found out that other people had this relationship with my dad that I had with other adults. And so I'm going to come back to why do we do kids' ministries? How does it relate to the Shema? How does it relate to culture? And I, I want to, I how, how many people in this room are, how many people are, are kids in the age of like 10 to 18? Raise your hands. 10 to 18-ish. Okay. All right. Let's see if you know what this is. Who remembers this? What is it? Kingdom Rock. Joe Beaver remembers it. What do you remember about Kingdom Rock? Do you remember anything at all? <laughs> okay, he doesn't, see? Um, do, you, do, do any of you remember? What year was this, by the way? 2013? Anybody remember what was going on in our church at that time? Remember who the guest stars of, who were the adults that came to VBS that year that were guest stars? Chrissy? Pastor Bernie. Pastor Bernie, that's right. Who was the guest dog? Does anybody remember? Bulldog? Logan and Chris's bulldog, DJ. This is how we try and create culture for our kids. You know, they remember what, who the adults were that were involved. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why this is important. I'm going to, I, but I want to show you to me the ultimate example I found on the internet. And this is VBS related. The ultimate example of a church creating culture around kids and VBS. Here we go. I mean, this is, I'm just, it's so incongruous to me to see this guy with his, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's Methodist, United Methodist. He's got all the vestments on. And he's up there singing off key, singing it. You know, this is a church that embraces their kids and puts it out on the internet. I mean, we have had conversations here about live streaming and how do we do it with quality. They're just putting it out there, I would say. Do you guys remember what the big part of Maker Fun Factory was? What was the big exciting thing in Maker? What? Dr. Gliebenstein. Does anybody remember how that, like, Chrissy, what, the, I think we awarded you with this at the end of Shipwrecked. What was it? Vilson. That's right. We have all these themes we try to weave through them so that for the rest of their lives they have stories to tell about these adults who were there. It doesn't sound like we saved anybody, does it? Doesn't sound like anybody got baptized out of it. Anybody professed their love for Jesus Christ out of it and said, man, I am a new person. I am ready to go. But we create a culture that makes them want to be part of this place. And um, I would say, I'm going to say something, one of my offensive, potentially offensive statements. You, and I'll direct it at me, you cannot create a community, a, a, a generation of community builders without being one yourself. Yeah. It is, it, it, I, I'm saying the probability is extremely low. It will be a pure, flat out miracle from God if you are not a creator in this community, and, but you want your kids to be someday. It's just not going to happen. We as adults create culture that says, hey, this is what we are about. This is how we walk the Shema. This is how we do this Why, when we get up and when we lie down and when we make breakfast. And, and, and we are committed to this. 
Because someday we want you kids to be committed to it. I got to tell you a few things I hate to hear. But I hear them all the time. If only the church had done more, better, any programs for my kids, they might have stayed in the church. By the way, there's a fatal flaw in all these statements, in my opinion. I don't bring my kids to kids' programs because I'm too busy. By the way, we have a kids' praise band here. We'd love to have your kids in it if they have musical talent and they want to develop it. they got to be here on Thursday nights to practice. Got to be here on Sabbath morning at 9 to practice. I can't help with kids' programs and kids' community because... And I mean, there's, there's probably some legitimate reasons there. Like, uh, that's not my gifting, right? My gifting's over here. I'm going to build the community over here. I don't bring my kids to kids... Pro- oh, I've heard this one before, uh, many times. I don't bring my kids to kids programs at here because you don't do it right. Um... That one, I have a very simple response to. I'd be happy to have you show us how to do it right. None of my kids' friends are at church. They're all at X. I would say to all of us as adults, if you don't want to do community, they won't want to do community. There's nothing you can do to force a kid, maybe when they're three, four, or five years old, say, oh, yeah, we're going to church. I don't like it, but you're going to like it. Once they get to be about 10, they'll see through that real fast, right? They will not grow up wanting to do it if you don't want to do it. That's the negative version of the Shema. So I would like to give you a twofold challenge today as a church, not a, maybe as individuals you decide how you want to take it. One is commit yourself to, the, to your Shema. Live your culture, endow your culture, edify your culture, build your culture, build community. Number one. Number two, decide and commit yourself to your kids growing up in a community that they love, that they're attracted to, where they have friends that, that build, is built on a Christian worldview. We all know this. There comes an age when our kids say, you know what, my friends are in X place. The people I love to be with are in this place. If that place isn't here, they're gone. We will not see them again. I've seen it happen every time. When, when kids come to church and say, yeah, I don't really have any friends here. This isn't my community. We will not keep them. We will not keep them. What is it? 90% of Adventist young people in North America do not remain churched, in the Adventist church at least. I would say, I would ask you to consider that keeping our kids in a place where we can talk to them about Jesus is not about programs, it's about where their community is. The corniest programs, stupidest stuff. Dr. Gliebenstein is stupid, (laughs) intentionally. But it works in community. The most amazing programs fail without community. We knew before Judy and I came to this church when our kids were infants, this church was known for having no kids, none. We each individually, because she was traveling here and I lived in Utah County, came here on a couple different occasions, no kids. And, um, And a friend of ours was hired by this church to be a, what do you call it, a co-op worker or something like that as a youth pastor. And he would drive up here from Utah County. Some of you know this. 
And he would come back to the Provo Church where we were, and that's where his home membership was. And we'd ask, how is it going? And he'd say, I organized all these programs, and literally no one showed up. Literally no one showed up. Not a person or one person, you know. I'm telling you, the best laid plans don't work unless the community invests in them as a community. Kids need to be here. They need to be here for life. The world is, the instant they're not here, their worldview is very, very, very different from what you and I all want, to have, want them to have. There's a famous, how many of you remember, know who Rich Mullins is? Rich Mullins, yeah, uh, contemporary Christian music singer in the 1990s. He died tragically in a, in a car crash. But he was once interviewed on, on um, contempor- uh, CCM, uh, Contemporary Christian Radio Station. And the interviewer was asking him, so Rich, you know, you're such an inspirational leader you know, to, to the world. Uh, you're such a light for Christ. What, what was your co- conversion experience? And he tells this story in concerts. He says, which time? And she's like, well, you know, the one where you gave your life to Jesus and you were born again. He's like, lady, which time? He's like, you're, you're talking about when I went to summer camp that time and I got baptized? Are you talking about that time when, right? And he lists off this whole string of experiences through his youth and his teenage years where he was born again, again. But they're all places in Christian community. It's a lot easier for children to be, kids to be reached for Christ here. A lot easier. Not saying we're going to be 100% successful on it, but. So I want to tell you, I want to bring this all together by telling you the story of Dewey. Thank you, Patrick. I will, since you asked. Judy reminded me of this. She was saying something in the car about, uh, You know, maybe the world would be a better place if a lot more kids in the world were raised in 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 someday school, if they had Christian youth camps to go to, if they had vacation Bible school, if they had these experiences, if they had these adults in their life, maybe the world would be a lot better place. And I remembered this story. It was a year ago, almost exactly, and I was in Georgia. And I was doing uh, basically a culture audit um, where I would just go out. It's kind of like an undercover boss, except they knew I was the boss, right? So I I would go out and I'd say, I'm going to be your grunt today. I just want to see how you do things. I'm just, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to do anything. I'm not here to train you. I just want to see what happens when nobody's watching, right? So I show up. All I had was a pin drop. I showed up at this location, and there's this guy, his name is Dewey, Dewey. He's like five foot six, hair down, you know, long hair, and, you know, I mean, just like, he's a good, good, good old boy from Georgia. And this, the first thing, and by the way, I live in a very profane world. And um, the first thing Dewey said is, who the bleep are you? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I, I'm so-and-so, and I'm just here. To, he, he says, I know, I know you were, I knew you were coming, but who are you? And I told him, you know, I told him, I said, well, you know, I'm the president of the company, but for today, I'm just your assistant. Oh, you're going to be my grunt. You're going to be my grunt. And then he goes, and he, you know, a tirade of profanity. Beep, 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 beep. You're such a beep, 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 Stupid. You know, and he says, the rest of the day, I'm not going to call you grunt. I'm going to call you beep, beep. And he's like, is that okay with you? And I said, if that's the way you treat people that work with you, you do that. I'm, I'm just here to see how you do this. Uh, he said, well, you're too stupid because you shouldn't have told me you were the boss. And so we went through the day work, and it was really hot, really hot. And it was a Thursday, the Thursday before vacation Bible school. And... Um, at the, uh, at the end of the day, it poured down rain. The sky opened, and it, it, like you couldn't, if you've lived there, you know. You can't see. And you think, I don't care if this truck is made out of metal, it's going to leak. Um, and we were, we were stuck in the cab waiting for the storm to pass. And it, and it was the end of the day. 
and he said, hey, my buddies and me, we got a softball game tonight, and we're going to have lots of beer, and, we're gonna, and then we're going to go out afterwards. He says, why don't you stick around? And I said, no, I can't. I said, I have a flight out of Nashville in like five hours. I got, you know, I got to be there. He said, he said what are you, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. He said, why? And I said, well, it's vacation Bible school. I got to be back for it. And um, he, uh, he said, well, that's kind of stupid. Why would you want to do that instead of going out and having fun? And I, and I, and you know, you know how guys get, sometimes they get a little bit rough with each other because we like each other a little, right? And I said, well, Dewey, vacation Bible school is important. I got to make sure those kids don't turn out like you. <laughs> and he turned away from me and didn't say a word. And I thought, you know, you know, there are times when you say stuff like that and you go, oh no, I said exactly the wrong thing. I could have insulted this guy any other way, but this one, some, for some reason, it, it hurt. And about, about a minute, he turns back to me and goes, well, he said, I, uh, God, Jesus has never had any use for me. But if Vacation Bible School keeps kids from turning out like me, then you go do that. You make sure you make your flight. And, and, I, and I, you know, I started, I started to say, you know, I said, well, do it. You can go with me, man. You know? And he's like, dude, you know I don't have that kind of PTO. And, and I was like, yeah, but, you know, I said, Jesus does have use for you. And honestly speaking, at this point in your life, the best place you could possibly be is vacation Bible school. The best place you could possibly be. 25 years old, profane, tattooed all over the place chawing all day long. Best place you could be is vacation Bible school. Which, would be, which is true if we as an organization, we have as a community have a Shema that says this is really important to us. This is our culture. Even when nobody's looking, we want to pass this on. We want to pass it on and, and have another generation and another generation and another generation pass it on. And I want, to, I want to play you a song to close this out. And then I'm going to say a few words. Then I'm going to pray. Okay? Telling our singers. This is a song for those of you. How many people we got watching on the live stream? Z? Two? Three? Three. I guessed right. If you're watching on the live stream, go to YouTube and look up Talking to Jesus Ryman Auditorium, R-Y-M-A-N. This, this is one of the most beautiful songs. I play it over and over and over again. It reminds me what we're all here about. It's by some artists at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. And um, I, I, because a lot of you don't speak Southern, I, I put the lyrics on the screen so you can read them because I want you to hear it. So we're going to see Talking to Jesus. Every generation has to create another generation of people that talk to Jesus. It, uh, as we go into Vacation Bible School Week, I always think about this because this is an all-church endeavor. There's like 40, 50 adults that are helping in one sh way, shape, or form. Patrick, give us air conditioning. Jason built a racket. Edie's not here today, but Edie and Tom, this is a week we're going to memorialize Tom a little bit because Tom, Tom was here every year. Karen, Cindy, I can go around this room, our station leaders, our crew leaders, our teenagers are involved, all of them, because we want to create a place, a community, we want to create a Shema, we want to create a culture where kids know, I don't know if we'll save them, but we want them to be talking to Jesus. So, I want to pray, and then you guys are going to sing, and then...
for those of you that want to, the postlude is going to be the best theme songs of Vacation Bible School. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful for the gifts you've given this community. When we have a, an event like Vacation Bible School, we are reminded about all that we have to offer, all that you've endowed us with. But we're also reminded of the calling you made on us, that we're supposed to walk this way, we're supposed to get up this way, and we're supposed to lie down this way. Lord, Vacation Bible School is just one thing. But I ask for a blessing on hands-on every person who's helping in big or small ways. That they will realize that they are here creating culture, creating another generation of kids that we hope, if they know nothing else, that they can talk to you. We ask this in your name. Amen.